This message is one of the Times Square Church pulpit series. It was recorded in the sanctuary of Times Square Church in Manhattan, New York City. Other tapes are available by writing World Challenge, P.O. Box 260, Lindell, Texas 75771, or calling 903-963-8626. You are welcome to make additional cassettes of this message for free distribution to friends. However, for all other forms of reproduction or electronic transmission, existing copyright laws apply. I want to speak to you, my message this morning, the cry of the watchman. Ezekiel 3, please, the cry of the watchman. Third chapter of Ezekiel. Let's start with verse 14. So the Spirit lifted me up and took me away, and I went in bitterness in the heat of my spirit, but the hand of the Lord was strong upon me. And I came to them, the captivity of Tel Aviv, that dwelt by the river Shabor, and I sat there, and I, I sat where they sat, and I remained there astonished among them seven days. It came to pass at the end of seven days, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, I've made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore hear the word at my mouth, and give them warning from me. When I say unto the wicked, Thou shalt surely die, and thou givest him not warning, nor speakest to warn the wicked from his way, to save his life. The same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thy hand. Yet if thou warn the wicked, and he turn not from his wickedness, nor from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. Again, when a righteous man doth turn from his righteousness, commit iniquity, and I lay a stumbling block before him, he shall die. Because thou hast not given him warning, he shall die in his sin, and his righteousness which he had done shall not be remembered, but his blood will I require at thy hand. Nevertheless, if thou warn the righteous man that the righteous sin not, and he doth not sin, he shall surely live, because he is warned, and thou hast delivered thy soul. Now, God, I, I know you put me at this pulpit today at this time in this place, and you brought together particular people, those that are here as a part of this body and those that have come as visitors. And we pray, Holy Spirit, that you find us. And you find us in your love and your mercy and your grace, first of all. And then if there's, if there's need of correction in our lives, give it, Lord. Begin with me. Lord, I've prayed for grace and mercy to help in our time of need. Now, I need an anointing and I need to speak your mind clear. Lord, I need it from your heart and not from mine. Lord, sanctify me and sanctify our ears as you sanctify my voice. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I've never claimed, you know, never claimed to be a prophet. But this one thing I do know, he's made me a watchman. Just one of many watchmen. Isaiah said of the watchman, he stands continually upon the watchtower in the daytime, and he's stationed every night at his guard post. Isaiah also said that men call to the watchman, saying, Watchman, how far gone is the night? In other words, what is the prophetic word of the Lord, and what are you hearing from God about the times? Isaiah 62, 6, I've set watchmen upon thy walls, O Jerusalem, which shall never hold their peace day or night. Yet are ye that make mention of the Lord, keep not silence. And this was to the watchmen. You that mention, make mention of the Lord, keep not silence. Give him no rest till he establish, until he make Jerusalem a praise in the earth. You see, as, as, as a watchman is truly a watchman sent by the Holy Spirit. He cannot condemn the righteous or encourage the wicked. The scripture says very clearly, he that justifieth the wicked and he that condemneth the just, even they both are abomination to the Lord. God himself said to the watchman, hear the word at my mouth and give them warning from me. Not only to the wicked, but to the righteous. Both faithfully warn that what I give you from my heart, and if you do, you have delivered your soul as a watchman. 
These words keep ringing in my heart, keep not silence. And then he goes on to explain in the previous chapter, don't be afraid of their looks. Don't be afraid of the uh, harshness of those who will not receive the word. And folks, many watchmen all over the world, I meet them that one time were sudden with God. They had a word from the Lord. They, they knew the times. There was no question God was speaking to them that they couldn't stand the hard looks of the people, the look of disgust. Or, oh, here we go again, some kind of a doomsday message. And so they turn away from it. It's too hard. They don't want to express the mind of God because of the cost. And, and now we have so few watchmen left in the country and in the world today, very few that are, are willing to stand up and God said, I'll give you a forehead of granite. I'll, I, I'll make it so that you don't care what anybody says and what they think of you, you will speak his mind. If you stay in my presence, I'll give you the word both to the wicked and to the righteous. I have a cry in my heart this morning. A watchman is told also to speak, not just the judgments of God and the coming events, but also to speak grace and mercy. I just read it to you. Say unto them, God has no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked should turn from their evil ways and live. If he turn from his sin and do what is lawful and right, none of his sins that he's committed shall be mentioned unto him, he shall surely live. Now, I, I, I want to give a warning this morning, because everywhere I go on the face of the earth, now every place I have been, I have seen something that is grieving my heart, and I feel I share the grief of God himself, God the Father. And I want to talk about an abomination that is sweeping the Pentecostal movements, especially in, in, in particular the charismatic movement. It is the defaming of the character and person of the Holy Spirit. Defaming the character and nature of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Ghost is being slandered and misrepresented by multitudes. He's been made a spectacle, a caricature of his very nature. A caricature. A, a, a false folly, a, a vision of folliness and... and, and uh, foolishness. There are so many around the world in the ministry today toying with the Holy Ghost, dangerously toying with the Holy Ghost. And we dare not be ignorant of what is happening lest we be caught up in this terrible abomination. All across America and all over the world now I see them lining up. They're lining up to have hands laid on them for what they call an impartation. The giving from me to you of the Holy Spirit. Impartation. There's a new thing coming down the, the religious turnpike now, and it's called the sealing of the Holy Ghost. I'm getting letters, and I couldn't understand it. Have you been sealed yet by the Holy Ghost so that you can be immune to the mark of the beast? It's originated in Texas. And this group says they have been given power to lay hands on people and now everywhere it's spreading now and this is going to hit Europe, it's going to hit all over and people are lining up to have an impartation being sealed by a man. You can get this impartation from one and pass it to another and, and now impart this sealing. In fact, if I have this, they say I lay on you, I'm going to seal you, you are going to be totally immune to future events, especially the mark of the beast. And, and I get pitiful letters from people, oh, please, Brother Dave, have you been sealed yet? Let me show you where the sin lies. Go to Acts, the eighth chapter, please. The eighth chapter of Acts. Let's start uh, verse 13. Then Simon himself believed also. This is Philip goes down to Samaria and he has a great revival. Many, many are being saved. And there's a sorcerer there named Simon 
who himself believed and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. When the apostles which were Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who when they came down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then laid their hands on them and they received the Holy Ghost. It says nothing about impartation, it says they received the Holy Ghost. Folks, I, there's no living person that can impart the Holy Ghost. They can lay hands on you and the Holy Ghost will impart himself to you. But not any man. Man does not possess the Holy Ghost. We are vessels. He can't, no man can give you the Holy Ghost. There is a laying on of hands and, and that is when you have, you have given completely to the Lord and you have gone through these things. Not just say believe on the Lord Jesus Christ because Simon did that. He was even baptized in water and he walked for a time with Philip. When Simon saw that through laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me also this, that on, not get this word, whomsoever. I'm going to come back to that. Whomsoever I lay hands, he shall receive the Holy Ghost. Peter said unto him, Your money perish with you because you thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent therefore of this thy wickedness. And pray God, if perhaps the thought of thy heart may be forgiven thee, I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. <sighs> Folks, here, here is the issue, and here is where the grief is, and here's where the sin is. Simon wanted to buy the gift of impartation. Now see, he wasn't willing to pay the price that Peter and John paid for this walk with God and with this faith that when they laid hands on people, the Holy Ghost himself would come and impart himself to these people. But you see, he's going to bypass the prayer closet. He's going to bypass mortification of the flesh. He's going to bypass the cross and all the death to self-life. And he's going to say, give it to me. I want power to lay hands on whomsoever I will. On whomsoever, anyone who lines up, anyone who comes. Now here's a man full of bitterness, of gall. He's living in sin. In fact, he's bound by sin, the apostle says. And he's going to take a shortcut. He don't want to pay the price. He wants it on his condition. No heart searching. No dealing with the Holy Spirit. I just want the power. I was uh, having lunch with the Lutheran Archbishop in one of these cities. And I, I perceived that he knew Christ and, and because there were tears rolling down his cheeks as he said at the conference. First time the Lutherans, and that was the state church there. And this Lutheran pastor is 700, I believe it was 700 churches, and we were having lunch. He said, Pastor Dave, a number of my pastors uh, claim not to be charismatic and they, they go somewhere and they have something imparted to them and they come back and, and they have all these incredible strange manifestations happening in, in the Lutheran churches and you see he acknowledges that they're God hungry men they're, they're men tired of ritual and they're tired of, of not having an anointing and so they they rush off either to the United States to one of our so-called revivals or they go to some place anywhere in Europe where they hear that there's some moving of the Holy Spirit and they have someone like they, they get excited. I want that. And so they have hands laid on them. They come back and he said, but David, here's my problem. And this archbishop read my book when he was in in the process of but when he was in seminary, God touched his heart. And so he's very open. And he said, I give an example. One of our largest, one of our large churches, they came back and the pastor has got this uh, importation and, and now these manifestations that people never seen or heard before. And he's not, he wasn't talking about praise and worship and hand clapping, the, these incredible, strange manifestations. And he said, the 
congregation had about a thousand. They, they kept dwindling and dwindling and dwindling. And he said, now they have left the Lutheran building and they have rented a little hall and there's just a handful and they call it revival. He said, why is it it's splitting our churches and why is it they're dwindling down to nothing and calling it revival? I said, sir, that is not revival. And, and I know what the issue is. I know what the problem is. You see, you can't take a shortcut to the true work of the Holy Spirit. Because I found out when I was there, confession after confession, I had bishops come to me and say, my men are coming to me and saying, I have not prayed in six months. I've not prayed in three months. I'm too busy. I just don't pray. One bishop got up and confessed publicly, I need to pray. I, you take a prayerless man who for six months doesn't even set God. He, he's totally neglecting God. And I'm not chastising. I'm not down on preachers at all. No, I wouldn't be doing this if God hadn't broken my heart and given me a love for them. And I'm not just preaching about preachers. I'm talking about people who are sitting in the pew in the seat that you sit. Really hungry, really sincere. You can be as sincere as anybody. You, you can be the most giving, loving person. But if you are not seeking God, you open yourself to all kinds of discouragement. You open yourself to every kind of demonic snare. You can have bitterness. You can say, I I'm really not mad at God when you really are mad at God. And then you go because you, you say, I can't wait. I have to have something now. You can't patiently wait. So you go to a meeting. And these people are going to come to New York City, going to rent halls all over the place, and come to impart something to you. And I'm going to tell you something. Be careful who lays hands on you. You go to a meeting. What would have happened if Peter and John didn't have the discernment and laid hands on a man full of sin and bitterness? He would have gone out and imparted his own solely spirit to everyone he touched. And you do not get the Holy Ghost from there. Don't let anybody lay hands on you that you don't know his life. You don't know his walk. You know nothing about him. He can be an adulterer. He can have a girlfriend in his apartment waiting for him that night. And you, you are there because you haven't been in the secret closet seeking God or the Holy Ghost would have laid hands on you in a secret closet. I'm not mad. I just feel a cry in my heart against the people taking shortcuts and don't want to seek the face of God. I can't find a handful of seekers anywhere I go. Leaders of denominations who don't pray for weeks and months. So busy. Sometimes I want to just get up and shout, Stop! All you mothers and mothers running around with your kids to dance classes. That's okay. It's bulky. Everything. You go night and day running around and I want to stand up and say, Stop! Because you don't have any time to pray. You don't have time to seek God. Stop! Just stop a minute. I want to see it to pass to stop. Because everywhere I go, I hear nothing but discouragement. I just got a call from our team that sets up my meetings now overseas there in, in Europe now. Call weeping. Saying our leaders, the leaders of entire denominations, uh, tears will down cheeks. Ask Brother David if he could get a word and come over and just encourage our pastors. Everybody's discouraged. Everybody's down. One, one country was scheduled to go, and I just felt the flood of the Lord last week to cancel it because I didn't feel the pastors were ready. And yesterday I knew why, because when I got a call and met with leaders, they said our pastors are so discouraged, so out of energy, we can't even set up a meeting for you. Now, if you'll come in and set it up, we'll come. 
so busy, so worn out, and so discouraged. And when I hear that, my natural reaction is to go into the closet and double my prayer effort and double my fasting and double seeking God as never before and get an encouraging word and go over and pat him on the back and say, brother, everything's okay, and just try to lift their spirits. But that's not the answer. That's not the answer. I can't preach even covenant to people who don't seek God. Have neglected him. You see, that's not the answer. That's not the need. Why, when you read the Bible, why do you hear this cry from the prophets? To sanctify yourself. Cleanse the temple. God says, I can't move. I can't come until I cleanse. You cleanse the temple. You cleanse it. Go into those lower Rooms. Go into every room and take out everything that's demonic. Take everything that is evil out before I can come and move. And why do you hear this all through the scripture? Why did Jesus emphasize the cleaning of the inside as well as the outside of the cup? And why on the day of Pentecost do you hear the cry from the Holy Ghost, save yourself from this perverse generation? Why? Because the Holy Ghost wants to move. The Holy Ghost wants to be poured out on flesh. But he has to have a sanctified body. He has to have a clean vessel. The Holy Ghost will not impart himself to an unclean vessel. And he says that I may, that I may, Simon says, that I may impart him to whomsoever. And when you go to a meeting, and here's my warning, and it's coming, you better believe it's coming. Don't it come and it'll sound good, the praise will sound loud and happy. If you don't have discernment, you're going to get in somebody's line. And they're going to impart to you their soulish spirit. And, and you know, in, in Europe, they say, well, when I went up and th this man, he, he, he could read my mind and he, he prophesied about my future. Folks, if that man is living in sin, what you heard is divination. And, and the devil can read your mind to convince you to go into this error. Read your mind. This confession that I hear everywhere I go, I don't pray. And some can't even remember the last time they prayed and sought God. I want you to go to Isaiah 32. Verse 1, Behold, a king shall reign in righteousness. Oh, beloved, look this way for a minute. In spite of all that you see around the world, when you see the enemy trying, uh, before, as soon as communism left some of these countries, these errors begin to just, I mean, they just fill the lands. They flood it in with this error. Until, until some, some pastors... Educated. Lutherans, Baptists, and, 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 and Pentecostals, they, they, they look and say, they, we don't know what's happening. All of the, what do you believe anymore? And, and of course, that comes from, from the lack of being in, really in the Word shut in with God. Because the first thing He gives you, if you're, you really walk with Him, is discernment. And you know the difference. Folks, you should know it here at Times Square Church. You should know the difference. But in spite of all the teaching here, 
I walk the street and somebody stops and say, hey, have you been hearing brother, do you know brother so-and-so? And I know them, I know that brother so-and-so is preaching error. And, and they're all excited and they're bringing their tapes and passing them out at Times Square Church. I'm a watchman. I'm on a wall warning. The tape that I'm preaching now goes out all over the world, as all of our tapes do now, and Internet. But you see, there's a king still reigning. He's on the throne. And he's in control. And there's such a thing as government, the government of Jesus Christ. And you can't get that government just sitting and hearing sermons. You can't get it by going to special meetings or listening to tapes. You get under the government of Jesus Christ by being shut in with him in this word in your hand. Then the Holy Ghost comes down and you are governed. You are convicted. You are led. You are shown the way. You are under the government of Jesus Christ through being a man or woman constantly seeking the face of God. Even in your car, on the subway, wherever you may be, you're seeking God because there's a king who is reigning. And if you spend time with him, he'll tell you what his heart is. And if you skip down to verse 3, you'll see the result of coming under the government of this Christ. The eyes of them that see shall not be dim. The ears of them that hear shall hearken. You'll hear the truth. God will bring forth message like you're hearing right now just to correct because you've got an ear open, because you're under the gum. You say, I want Jesus to rule and reign in my life. I want Jesus to take full control. I don't want to do anything without consulting him. You, you've got to be spending time with him to get to that place. Now I bring you to probably one of the most tragic verses in the Bible, verse 6. You see, here, here's the Simon. Here, here, are the, here are the Simon pastors who in, try to impart, and those Simon seekers who don't want to pay the price. The vile person will speak villainy in his heart, will work iniquity to practice hypocrisy. You know what the word hypocrisy means? Jesus warned, beware of the hypocrisy of the Pharisees. Remember what it says? To utter error against the Lord. Hypocrisy is, is uh, the word itself means actor. It, it means claiming a virtue you don't have. Claiming to be something. It's living a double life. Coming, praising the Lord, seeking God, putting on a front that you're a holy, righteous person. When inside, Jesus said, full of dead men's bones. And sin, he said, that's hypocrisy. But he, he said, they practice hypocrisy to utter error against the Lord. And if you, I want to tell you something. If, if, if you sit under the corrective, anointed, loving word of God, coming from those who are not trying to chastise, you see, God never tries to beat us down when he chase, chases us all out of love. That's the greatest act of mercy God can do, is, is, is to bring chastening just to get us back into his grace and, and, and walking in line with his word. But he says, they, these practice hypocrisy, utter arrogance, Lord. And what is the result? Making empty the soul of the hungry and causing the drink of the thirsty to fail. Look at me, please. Any man, any woman, any anointed person, or whether any preaching person who stands in this pulpit full of hypocrisy, putting on an act, doesn't matter who they are, me included, anyone, there's no life, nothing is imparted, nothing is given, but people leave hungry and thirsty. And this goes for husband who's the priest of his home, if he's living in hypocrisy. All his words are in vain to his family. Because you not only have nothing to say 
But those who are hungry, you make them even hungrier. Those who are thirsty, you make them even thirstier. You just dry up their soul. How sad. Very, very sad. And that's, it's happening so many places. Can I, can I close on a good note? When I was in, in, uh, on this last trip, I, everywhere I go, I'm invited to speak. Our, our, our meetings close like on a Saturday night. And I've been invited everywhere to speak in churches. But, you know, if you go to a city and there are 40, 50 churches that are cooperating, you can't choose one. So I, I, I've always turned it down. And there was one dear brother who pastored a large church in Kiev. I, I, I was told they had about 10,000. I don't know the numbers. <clears throat> but I kept telling us, I, I'm sorry, I've turned down so many requests. I can't choose one. Please, I, I feel that I may be back here in two years. I'll come and visit you then. He said, two years. I said, yeah, two years from now, if I'm here, I'll come. I said, all right. And I got up Sunday morning and uh, put on a, just a sports shirt and went down to eat. Uh, I had a leisure jacket on, and I went down to eat with some missionary, a missionary couple that invited me to have breakfast with them. They've been missionaries, I think, for eight years in Russia and Ukraine. And while I was sitting there, I said, and something came on me. I said, there's a, a church, I understand, near this hotel. And he said, yeah, about eight, ten blocks down the street. The Holy Spirit said, go. Just go and sit. And this was the man who invited me. So I, we, we walked over. The service was probably half over. And they sat me in the front seat, and the pastor saw me, and he stopped the service. He said, we're going to change the order of service. Pastor Dave's going to preach. <laughs> and I didn't uh, The Lord had been stirring my heart. Just that morning, I was contemplating this message, washing feet. And I didn't know that church literally washes feet. It's a foot washing church, foot washing Pentecostals. And, and this man is a very godly man. He, 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 he's charitable. He has homes for drug addicts and homes for homeless women and children. And very, very uh, righteous man. And I got up to speak on foot washing. And, and it was done loving. The Holy Spirit came over and said, folks, Frank, I wouldn't want many of you washing my feet. I think you'd dirty them because of what's in your heart. You go through these. I said, I, I've never seen such division in all my life as I see here in your country and in this city. I said, some of you grandmas, you're so sure you don't miss putting this little thing on your head, a little covering. And yet if a girl comes in here with pink hair and pants on, in one church, they have a whole bunch of skirts. Anybody comes in with short skirts, they wrap this long one around them. That's the truth. You better have your little cover. But I said, you, you grandmothers, you mothers of Zion, they come in, you go and ask that girl to change it, or us go out and not, you don't have a right to sit here looking like you do if they're short. The dress was a little short and they were a little stoned. I said, where in the world are the mothers of Zion? I just go and hug them and become a mother to them. And I, I was just, that's the kind of preaching. I don't know why I was saying what it was and the need for unity and all the disunity and all the things hidden in the hearts. And, and I'm thinking, why am I here? And I preached. And the pastor was sitting backstage and I, I called him up. And 
I said, I will pray for you. He, I had him kneel down and I anointed him and prayed that God would use him to bring unity to the pastors in the country because he's the leading past, one of the leading pastors. And he got up and I, I whispered, I'm, I'm finished. I'm going back to the hotel. He said, no, you're not. I, I said, I'm, I'm finished. He, he said, no, please sit down. I have to make a confession to this congregation. And this man got up weeping. He said they were in a building program that it, for another building and it had taken so much of his time. He said, I have robbed you of time. Time with God and time with you. And he just poured out his soul weeping. And suddenly people started coming up on stage. And I had an interpreter by me, and here's uh, the man comes up and interrupts him. He's weeping. He takes the microphone. He's an associate pastor. And he cries out. He said, I've been so bitter because I was associate pastor of the church, and the pastor put me in head of the charities ministry, and I, didn't, I felt pushed aside. And he said, all you people have been talking to and said, you're going to leave this church. I've sinned against you and this pastor. Don't leave this church. And he and the pastor fell each other's arm and then fell on their knees, weeping. Comes another, comes a lady. She's in charge of a uh, ministry for women. She had been a doctor, quit her practice, and had started this home. And she had, she said publicly, I had planned shortly to break this ministry of ours away from the church. Felt neglected, the pastor neglected us. And she turned and said, I am so sorry, I've been in rebellion. And she hugged him and said, I repent, I'll never leave this church. And I said, people, don't leave this church. God is here. And then the youth pastor came. He got on his knees. He said, we're just young people. We want to clap our hands. We want to praise the Lord. And we know all you older folks can't handle that. And we've grieved you. We're sorry. We've grieved you. We don't know what to do because we want to sing. But we should do it at your expense. We've grieved you. We're sorry. We repent. One after another, then the whole staff and people is confessing. Folks, you talk about... We talk about manifestations of the Holy Spirit. Manifestation. There's nobody on stage showing off. There's nobody laying hands on anybody. There's nobody seen. Nobody knows what's happening. There's an unseen hand at work. The Holy Ghost is doing something because the Word has come forth as a sharp two-edged sword and it's found its mark and it's found hearts that are hungry and repentant. And suddenly God began to move pastor didn't have the slightest idea this was there. I was shocked. I, I was overwhelmed. I just sat there weeping and said, I don't know what's going on. And, and this goes on for an hour, the confessions, and then everybody on their knees, and all their grandmas weeping, and God moving, and the Spirit. The next morning, I got a letter from the pastor, a, a, a letter saying, Brother Dave, in one hour, God changed our church. God changed our church. And they left me. They, they, there was a carving. I don't know where they found it. About this high, wood carving, beautiful. It's Jesus washing Peter's feet. And I have it in my room, my study, as a reminder. The true manifestation of the Holy Spirit. When he comes to convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. And he does that out of mercy and grace. That was one of the most merciful services I've ever seen. Missionaries were walking home and said, this was a divine appointment, Brother Dave. I've never seen anything like this in all my years. I said, neither have I. See, in all of our praying and of all our seeking of God, we don't allow the Holy Spirit when he comes to deal with issues in here, sin, 
if we don't make things right with our brother and sister. If you're talking about any one of the pastors in this church, or, or, or think, and, and you've got this, and you've just been gossiping, and you've got that spirit in you, there's no way you can come into the fullness of Christ. There's no way the word's going to make sense to you. You're going to be one of those who run off and get something imparted to you. And I walked away, and I've been thinking ever since, what, what would have happened if, if I had gone in there and, and believed this impartation message and start calling the assistant pastor up and say, I impart to you the Holy Ghost, or I would impart to you the fire of God. And I go down the line, and here they're all lining up to have an impartation, and he's still got his bitterness in his heart. He's got rebellion in his heart. What kind? He's going to go out then and impart to the congregation, lay hands and have prayer meetings with the drug addicts and alcoholics, and say, I received an impartation, now I impart it to you? What is he going to impart? His bitterness, his jealousy, and everything that's in his heart. I saw revival. And revival comes when we really make things right. If you sit in this church and you have to walk down this aisle because you can't face somebody sitting over here, God help you. God loves you. You, God's going to deal with you in a loving way. It's such a wonderful chastening, but. Folks, when the Holy Ghost comes, it's just a matter of opening up and saying, Lord, I want everything you have. Folks, I don't want God to bypass me. I want everything God has for me. I don't want him to bypass me. And I, I look around in my life and I see the faithfulness of God everywhere I look and said, Oh, God, <laughs> I don't want to lose sight of your faithfulness. I love the divine order, Jesus. I'm not going to sell it cheap. For some little five-minute gossip session, or listen to somebody's dirty joke. I don't want to have anything in my heart against anybody else. I want no jealousy. I want no pride. I don't want any ambition in me. God, deal with it. Show me when it's there. Any hypocrisy, get it out, Lord, because I want nothing to hinder the flowing of the Holy Ghost in my heart. And I want that manifestation of conviction. That this word, when I read it, it convicts me. When I hear Pastor Carter or any one of these pastors preach it, it, it's the sword that goes into my belly. And I say, God, I'm going to go home and make it right. I'll do whatever's necessary. God, I hear your word. I want to obey you. Why? Because I want the true manifestation of the Holy Ghost in my life. Stand, please. Hallelujah. Now, Lord Jesus, you have your own marvelous way that we don't understand, a way to speak conviction and encouragement and life to us. And I pray, Holy Ghost, that you speak to this congregation this morning. Lord, we're facing days that we've never seen before. We're facing times like we've never known. And Lord, in these times when, when people uh, are downcast because of what they see coming on the earth, men's hearts filling with fear, they're going to be running for shortcuts. They're going to be looking for somebody to give them instant peace or an instant touch. Lord, for this body, I pray that you take us to the closet. Take us to your innermost hidden place. And in secret, Lord, that you speak to us and you minister to us. You show us your word and your faithfulness. We give you honor and glory and praise. In Jesus' name, amen. And the Lord's here in a loving way. He's not chastening, he's warning. But I'm going to make it, uh, I'm going to give an invitation. Simple. It's about prayer. And folks, I, I have to take a minute, please. Just bear with me. 
I have met people that are in the throes of death. They're, all, they're in critical illness. And others that are in their 60s, 70s, and some of them in their 80s. And they're looking back over their life and they're full of regrets. Full of regrets. I didn't pray. I didn't see God. I missed so much. And I was thinking about that last night and then this morning when I got up. And that's what the Lord put this on my heart. If you stand here now and you're looking back, just look back last week, a month, a week, a year. Look back over your whole life. Have you missed a prayer life? Have you missed being shut in with God in such a way that you, you, you have become strong in Him? Or have you to a place where you only pray when there's a crisis? You only pray when, when something happens. Here's the word I have for you. If you start today, right now, in the next five minutes, if you will make a pledge and you, and you set your heart, I missed it, yes. I'm not a man of prayer. I'm not a woman of prayer. I haven't been seeking God as I should. If you will it, by the power of the Holy Ghost, ask the Holy Ghost to help you keep this heart set. God will forgive that whole past. And he'll restore to you all the years the canker worm has eaten. And you can have a prayer life from now to the day Jesus takes you or you die or Jesus comes. You can start now and have a history. And if you should die in just a month from now or a year from now, you look back and the Lord says, if you had prayed all of your life because you set your heart now, you've not missed anything because I've restored it all to you. I've restored it all to you. And I'm going to invite those to come, only those who say, David, Pastor David, that is me. I, I, I'm not a prayer. I'm really not a God seeker. And I want to be, and I want to have a life of prayer. And I'm going to set my mind, and we'll pray with you that God will do something supernatural in your heart as you make this decision this morning. Now, if you're not saved, if you don't know Jesus, if you're backslidden, you've been running from the Lord, I want you to come with these that are coming. Nobody needs to know. It's between you and the Lord. Up in the balcony, go to the stairs on either side and come and follow these that are coming. I'm calling for those who want to set your heart. I'm going to be a seeker after God. I set my heart. And I'm going to ask of you to start 15 minutes. If you, have to. you can come today and start this by coming to the next service an hour earlier, an hour and a half or so, sitting in the presence of the Lord, sealing this pledge before the Lord. Those in the audience, all over, the, wherever you hear me, if you feel this tug and pull at your heart, so, Pastor Dave, more than anything, I, I, I want to seek God daily. I, I, I want to put Him first in my life now. Even if you've missed it, come on now, take a step of faith with me. Even those who didn't step out in your seat, just lift your hands. Just lift up your hands. And let's all right now lift up. And I want you to pray this prayer from your heart right now. Lord Jesus, I don't want to neglect you. You say in your word that your people have neglected you days without number. I don't want to be in that number. Lord Jesus, come. Forgive me first for the hours of neglect. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that you come upon me now and woo me and call me into the secret place of prayer, that as of this day, from now on, you will remind me and you will help me and encourage me to come into your presence and seek you and call in your name. And by faith, I will to do this. I want to do this, but I need your help. Cleanse me, Jesus. Sanctify me. Blot out my transgressions. 
and all hypocrisy, I yield to you in Jesus' name. Search me and try me. Find every wicked way. Forgive and cleanse. Now just love him and thank him. Lord, I thank you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. I give you praise. This is the conclusion of the message.